Chapters 46 and 47 of Problems in American Democracy. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Allison Hester of Athens, Georgia. Problems in American Democracy by Times Williamson. Chapter 46. The State Executive. A. The Governor. 583. The Election of the Governor. In every state in the Union, the Governor is elected by popular vote. In most of the states, this election takes place, together with that of other state officials, on the Tuesday following the first Monday in November. Usually, a gubernatorial candidate is required to be at least 30 years of age. He must be a United States citizen and also a resident of his state of at least five years standing. The governor's term varies from two years in Massachusetts to four years in more than 20 states. In general, the term of office is increasing. The average salary received by a state governor is $5,000 a year. 584. Limitations upon the governor. A number of factors operate to limit the power of the state governor. The federal constitution limits his authority by declaring that persons charged with crime in and escaped from a neighboring state must be delivered up to the executive authorities of the state in which the crime is charged to have been committed. The executive power of state government is not concentrated under the governor, but is shared by the governor with a host of administrative officials. Many of these officials are elected directly by the people and cannot therefore be held accountable by the governor furthermore the actual execution of the state laws rests primarily with municipal and other local officials and over these officers the governor has little or no control the express powers of the president of the united states have been rather liberally interpreted by the courts but the powers of the state governor have generally been construed in a narrow and literal sense in many states, the power of the governor rarely or never extends beyond the express limits imposed by the state constitution. 585. Executive Powers of the Governor The governor is charged by the state constitution to see that the laws are faithfully executed. This is similar to the chief duty of the President of the United States, but whereas the President is aided by subordinate administrative officials over whom he has complete control, the Governor must act through a large number of state and local officials over whom he has little effective control. Of some value, however, is the power of the Governor to exercise general supervision over the various executive officers of the state. He enjoys, in addition, the power to appoint many of the subordinate administrative officials. Usually, these appointments must be confirmed by the upper house of the state legislature. In most cases, the governor cannot remove officials so appointed without the consent of the Senate or Council. The governor is commander-in-chief of the armed forces of the state and when the regular officers of the law are unable to cope with domestic violence he is empowered to call out the militia in this connection the governor has the power of suspending the writ of habeas corpus though most states declare that this writ may not be suspended except in times of rebellion and invasion Two or three states have recently provided that the writ of habeas corpus may not be suspended in any case whatsoever 586. Legislative Powers of the Governor In general, the Governor occupies the same relation to the state legislature as does the President toward Congress. Thus, the Governor may send periodic messages to the legislature and may recommend such legislative measures as he believes desirable. The Governor often communicates with the legislature concerning the financial condition and needs of the state. The governor may also call special sessions of the state legislature for the consideration of urgent matters. In case the two houses of the legislature are unable to agree for a time for adjournment, the governor may adjourn the state legislature. In one respect, the governor's power of veto exceeds that of the president, 
for in about two-thirds of the states the governor may veto individual items in appropriation bills this privilege is denied the president who must accept or reject a bill as a whole like the president the governor influences legislation through his relations with the leaders of his party in the legislature as well as through his power of the patronage 587 judicial powers of the governor in almost every state the governor has considerable control over the issuance of pardons and reprieves in the case of all offenses committed against the state in some states the power to issue pardons and reprieves is exercised with the consent of the state legislature in other states the governor shares this power with a board of pardons in a few states the governor may act alone 588 tendency of the governor's power to increase the earlier state constitutions tended to restrict the powers of the governor and to extend liberal grants of power to the state legislature of recent years the abuse of legislative power has tended to encourage suspicion of the legislature and a growing confidence in the governor as a consequence the governor's term is in many states increasing in the effort to shorten the ballot and concentrate responsibility for the state administration upon some one official, various states are increasing the appointive power of the governor. In a few states, the governor now has authority to make special inquiries into the workings of the various executive departments with a view to checking inefficient and irresponsible methods of work. In some states, the governor's share in budget making is increasing in the majority of states the general tendency toward a shorter ballot the reorganization of the state administration and other methods of reforming state government will probably continue to enlarge the power and influence of the governor part b the state administration 589 the older group of administrative officers aside from the governor the administrative officers of the state fall into two groups first the older officers who are relatively few and who are almost always elective and second the newer officers boards and commissions who are relatively numerous and who may be either elective or appointive the first group comprises such officers as the lieutenant governor the secretary of state the state treasurer the auditor or comptroller and the attorney general these older officers are usually elected at the general state election for a term varying from state to state. These officers are not under the control of the governor, but fulfill duties prescribed by the Constitution and are responsible only to the people and to the courts. They may be, and often are, of a different political party than the governor, and since they are not under the control of that official, they often work at cross-purposes with him. This lack of coordination is in striking contrast to the harmony of action existing between the President of the United States and the heads of the federal executive departments. 590. The Newer Group of Administrative Officers As state government has increased in complexity, the older group of administrative officers has been supplemented by the addition of a large number of new officers. These newer administrative officials are quite numerous but their general character may be indicated by dividing them into two classes. The first class includes individual officers, such as, for example, a superintendent of prisons, state architect, a state historian, a commissioner of health, a food inspector, a geologist, a commissioner of corporations, a commissioner of banking, a superintendent of public works, and a state surveyor. Besides individual officers, the newer group of administrative officials includes a large number of boards and commissions which have been created by the state legislature and endowed with large powers for the study and control of specific matters. The following boards and commissions are examples of this second class. A state civil service commission, a tax commission, a board of charities and correction, a water supply commission, a tax equalization board, a quarantine commission, a voting machine commission, a board of pharmacy, a highway commission, and a public service commission. 591. 
Defects of State Administration The enlargement of the state administration by this creation of numerous individual offices, boards, and commissions indicates an attempt on the part of state governments to grapple with the problems of democracy. Nevertheless, this rapid growth of state administration has had serious consequences. Once created, many of the newer officers have attempted to perpetuate themselves. State legislatures have been harassed by boards and commissions seeking unnecessary appropriations. Politicians without expert training or ability are often placed on boards and commissions dealing with technical matters. Responsible and efficient state government is rendered difficult by the inability of the governor effectively to control the few elective officials who constitute the older group of administrative officers. An even greater difficulty arises from the creation and expansion of the newer group of officers. The excessive number of individual officers, boards, and commissions makes for inefficient and irresponsible government. Some of these officials are elected by the people, others are appointed by the governor. Their terms vary so widely that, as Professor Beard had pointed out, the appointing power never has an opportunity to make a clean sweep and introduce more efficient administrative methods. There is little or no coordination between the various administrative offices and very little centralization of responsibility. 592. The State of Civil Service The spoil system has long constituted a defect, not only in the federal government, but in American state government as well. And, as is in the case of the national government, this evil has been attacked primarily through the merit system. New York State led the way in 1883 by passing a Comprehensive Civil Service Act. This law provided for a commission authorized to cooperate with the governor in preparing rules, classifying the state civil service, and conducting the examinations for the positions to be filled. Since then, Massachusetts, Wisconsin, Colorado, New Jersey, California, Ohio, Illinois, and other states have adopted some type of civil service system. State civil service laws are largely modeled after the National Civil Service Act of 1883. In most of the legislating states, laws of this type provide for competitive examinations of a practical nature. They prohibit political and religious interrogatives. They forbid the assessment of holders of civil service positions for political purposes. Appointment and promotion are upon the basis of merit, although, as is in the case of the Federal Civil Service, the standards for judging the character and capacity of individual office holders have not yet been perfected. End of chapter 46. Chapter 47. The State Legislature. 593. Structure of the State Legislature. The representative branch of state government is known under different names in various states, but the term state legislature is in more or less general use. The state legislature is invariably a two-chambered body. The upper house is the smaller and is called the Senate, while the lower and more numerous branch is variously known as the House of Representatives, House of Delegates, or Assembly. Usually, the state senate differs from the lower house in certain important particulars. The senatorial districts from which members of the upper house are elected are always larger than are the districts from which members to the lower house are chosen. Senators are usually chosen for longer terms than are representatives. As in the case of the national senate, the senate, in most states, is made a continuous body by the provision that its members shall begin their terms at certain periodic intervals. In the lower house of the state legislature, on the other hand, all of the members take their seats at the same time. 594. Basis of Representation For the purpose of electing members of the state legislature, practically all of the states are divided into numerous senatorial and representative election districts. Some states apply the rule that representatives in the state legislature shall be apportioned among districts containing practically an equal number of inhabitants. Other states, however, provide exceptions to this rule. 
For example, Alabama, Florida, New York, and other states provide that each county shall have at least one member in the House. Often the result of this arrangement is that the smaller or more sparsely populated counties are overrepresented in the state legislature, while the more populous counties are underrepresented. Several states, notably Connecticut and Vermont, arrange representation in the state legislature so that with respect to overpopulation, cities are underrepresented and rural districts are overrepresented. 595. Membership. The state constitution determines the qualifications for those who are entitled to vote for state legislatures. Footnote. For an enumeration of these qualifications, see Chapter 33, Section 415, end of footnote. Generally, anyone qualified to vote for a state legislator is also eligible to membership. However, holders of both federal and state offices are excluded from sitting in the state legislature. In some states, the term of a senator is the same as that of a representative, but generally senators are elected for a longer term than are members to the lower house. Representatives are generally chosen for two years, senators for four. In all states, members of the legislature are paid either a fixed annual salary or a per diem allowance based upon the length of the legislative session. In most states, senators and representatives receive equal compensation. All state legislators are privileged from arrest or civil process during the session. In addition, they enjoy the usual privilege of free speech in their official capacities. 596. Organization. Formerly, state legislatures met annually, but at present, the great majority convene only once in two years. In the effort to cut down the amount of superfluous legislation, a number of state constitutions now restrict the legislative session to from 40 to 90 days. The legislature may adjourn itself to meet later in special session, or the governor may call special sessions. The governor may adjourn the legislature if the two houses fail to agree upon a time for adjournment. In an internal organization, the state legislature resembles Congress, except that the lieutenant governor is often the presiding officer of the Senate, each house chooses all of its own officers. Each house determines its own rules of procedure and keeps a journal of its proceedings. In addition, each house exercises the right of deciding upon the qualifications of its members and disciplines and punishes its members for misconduct. As in the national legislature, work is expedited by the committee system. The party is a dominant force in the state as well as in the national legislature. 597. Powers of the State Legislature The lawmaking powers of the state legislature extend practically to all subjects. The presumption is that this body has a right to legislate upon any subject unless specific prohibitions have been imposed upon it by either the federal or the state constitution. The federal constitution forbids any state legislature to emit bills of credit, coin money, or pass laws impairing the obligation of contracts. Neither bills of attainder nor ex post facto legislation may be enacted by a state legislature. The federal constitution likewise declares that state legislatures may neither abridge the privileges and immunities of citizens of the United States, nor deprive persons of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. No state may deny to any person within the state jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Restrictions imposed by the state constitution fall into several groups. These include restrictions in favor of trial by jury, religious freedom, and other privileges usually embodied in a Bill of Rights, provisions controlling the grant of special favors to corporations, restrictions upon the financial powers of the state legislature, provisions defining the framework of state government, and prohibitions upon the power of the legislature to pass special and local laws. Footnote. A special or local law is one which applies to some particular individual or corporation, or to some particular city, county, or other locality. 
prohibitions upon special and local laws are necessary in order to prevent the legislature from extending special favors to particular individuals or localities end of footnote 598 how a state law is made bills may originate in either house of the state legislature except that in most states money bills must originate in the lower chamber to illustrate law-making in the state legislature, let us assume that a bill is introduced in the lower house. This may be done by any one of several methods. Any member of the house may deposit a bill in a box near the speaker's desk. Sometimes a bill is introduced by the report of a committee or even by a messenger from the Senate. When the bill has been introduced, it is given a first reading. With the consent of the House, the Speaker then refers the measure to the appropriate committee. The adverse report of the committee generally kills the bill, but if the bill is favorably reported, and this report is approved by the House, the bill is placed on the order of second reading and is debated section by section, unless by unanimous vote it is advanced to the third reading. If the bill passes the second reading, it is generally referred to the committee on revision. It is then engrossed, reported back to the House for a third reading, and the final vote. Sometimes the yeas and nays of this final vote are entered upon the journal, so that the responsibility may be fixed upon each member. The bill then goes to the Senate, where the procedure is very much like that of the House, except that the committee of the whole sometimes takes the place of the order of the second reading as conducted in the house 599 the bill goes to the governor in every state except north carolina a bill which has passed both branches of the legislature must then go to the governor for approval if this officer signs it it becomes law if he disapproves it he returns it with his objections to the house in which it originated in spite of this objection by the governor, the legislature may enact the measure into law if a sufficiently large majority in each house votes in favor of the bill. This majority is usually two-thirds of the members in each house. Generally, the governor has a ten-day period in which to consider bills. If a bill is not returned to the legislature with his objections within this period, it automatically becomes law without his signature unless the adjournment of the legislature prevents its return to that body. In most states, the governor has the important privilege of vetoing particular items in appropriation bills while sanctioning the rest of the measure. 600. Defects in State Legislation There is, among students of American government, a general agreement that the legislative procedure of the various states evidences a number of serious defects. One of these defects is the absence of responsibility. Any member of the state legislature may introduce as many bills as he likes, but he need not assume responsibility for any of them. Another serious evil is the lack of experience and technical skill on the part of the legislators. Legislators are frequently ignorant of the subject matter with which they are called upon to deal. There is a tendency for legislators to ignore the effect of a new statute upon the existing body of law, nor is the constitutionality of the measure contemplated always taken into account. Ill-advised and pernicious legislation is the result. Log rolling and lobbying constitute another defect of state legislation. Log rolling leads to the passage of numerous bills without their adequate scrutiny by individual members and without either individual members or legislative committees assuming responsibility for those measures. The pressure exerted upon state legislatures for legislation favoring special interests is still great. 601. The Reform of Legislative Procedure a few states have attempted to overcome the lack of technical information on the part of legislators by providing for expert bill drafters. In New York, for example, the state legislature has been provided with a number of competent bill drafters whose duty it shall be, during the session of the legislature, to draw bills, examine and revise proposed bills, and advise as to the legal effect of any legislation. 
These bill drafters may be set to work on the request of either house or of a committee member or officer thereof. A large number of states now have a legislative reference bureau, which keeps a careful record of the laws passed in the various states of the Union. This bureau maintains a library and issues bulletins for the guidance of legislators. In 1909, Wisconsin created the Office of Reviser. This officer keeps a loose-leaf system of laws and collects court decisions affecting statutes. At the beginning of each session, this officer also presents to the committees on revision of each house of the legislature bills providing for such consolidation and revisions as may be completed from time to time. The reviser supervises the preparation, printing, and binding of such compilations of particular portions of the statutes as may be ordered by the head of any state department. There is an increasing tendency to curb lobbying in state legislatures. The laws of New York and Wisconsin may be taken as typical. That of New York provides that every person retained or employed for compensation as a counsel or agent by any person, firm, corporation, or association to promote or oppose, directly or indirectly, the passage of any bill or resolution must be registered every year in the office of the Secretary of State and must give the name of the person by whom he is retained. The Wisconsin law provides that legislative agents or councils may not attempt to influence members privately, but must confine themselves to arguing before committees and filing printed briefs with the members of the legislature. End of chapter 47